So, hello everybody. Today is Wednesday, April 3rd, and it is 8.30 Eastern Standard Time. This is when our meeting starts. My name is Christina, oh, sorry, Christina J, and I am a recovered Alana, and I will be leading this meeting. All right, so we want to welcome everyone to our Al-Anon Big Book meeting. This is a step speaker meeting that meets every Wednesday night at 8.30 Eastern Standard Time. We're going to be studying the 12 steps by using the precise instructions out of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, as they relate to us as Al-Anons. So let's get our meeting started. This is the original AA preamble, um, and AA stands for the book Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the textbook that we will be using tonight, and whenever I mention Big Book, um, it's referring to that book. So the preamble of the AA Grapevine describing the fellowship in 1940. We study the preamble with an open mind and an open heart to consider how it applies to Al-Anon. This helps us to stay focused on the message of recovery the pioneers intended while observing the traditions in action. Through the actions taken by the instructions of the basic text, we comprehend what the pioneers meant when they described the membership of AA, which is that they worked a program of recovery and they no longer drank. In our case, we no longer obsessively think, um, particularly when it comes to the alcoholic. Though continuous action and study of these principles, the understanding of the value of the original preamble reveals itself. We ask for your humble consideration of our sincere admiration of the pioneers of Alcoholics Anonymous. The simple hope is that we of Al Anons will grow in the same clarity and unity that birthed the original 12-step fellowship, because without them, after all, none of us would be here. Okay, so the original AA preamble. We're gathered here because we were faced with the fact that we were powerless over alcohol and unable to do anything about it without the, pow the help of the power greater than ourselves. We feel that each person's religious views, if any, are his own affair. The simple purpose of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is to show that we, show what me, excuse me, show what may be done to enlist the aid of a power greater than ourselves regardless of our individual conception of that power, what it might be. In order to form a habit of depending upon and referring all we do to that power, we must first apply ourselves with some diligence. By often repeating these acts, they become habitual, and the help rendered becomes natural to us. We have come to know that as alcoholics, we suffer from serious disease, which medicine has no cure. Our condition may be the result of an allergy, which makes us different from other people. It has never been permanently cured with any treatment with which we are familiar. The only relief we have to offer is absolute abstinence, the second meaning of AA. There are no dues or fees. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. Each member squares his debt by helping others to recover. An Alcoholics Anonymous member is an alcoholic who, through the application of and the adherence of the AA program has forsworn the use of any and all alcoholic beverages in any form. The moment he takes so much as one drop of beer, wine, spirits, or any other liquid containing alcohol, he automatically loses his status as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. AA is not interested in sobering up drunks who are not sincere in their desire to stay sober for all time. Not being reformers, we offer our experience only to those who want it. We have a way out on which we can absolutely agree and on which we can join in harmonious action. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our program. Those who do not recover are people who will not or, can, or simply cannot give themselves to the simple program. Now, you might like our program, or you may not, but the simple fact remains that it works, and we believe it is our only chance to recover. There is a vast fun included in the AA Fellowship. Some people might be shocked at our seemingly worldliness and levity, but just underneath there lies a deadly earnestness and a full realization that we must push per, sorry, <laughs> that we must put first things first. And with us, the first thing is the solution to our alcoholic problem. To drink is to die. Faith must work 24 hours a day in and through us or we perish. So in order to set our tone for this meeting, I ask that we bow our heads in a few moments um, of silence and then prayer and meditation to pray and meditate, and then we'll follow that with the serenity prayer. And you guys can say that um, kind of to yourselves because I have it in presentation mode, but it's, it's here for us. So a moment of silence.
and prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Thy will, not mine, be done. So I wish to remind you that whatever is said in this meeting expresses our own individual opinion as of today and as of this point, up to this point. We do not speak for AA as a whole. You are free to agree or disagree as you see fit. In fact, it is suggested that you pay no attention to anything which might not be reconciled with what is in the AA big book. If you do not have a big book, it is time you bought one. Read it, study it, live with it. Follow the directions in it and learn what it means to be an AA. And that is the end of the preamble. Um, Okay, so I think that this part is talking about sponsorship, and that will be at the end of the meeting. All right, cool. So I just want to make sure that I'm following the script so that <clears throat> I keep you guys and keep the meeting in order because it's really important to follow the guidelines of each fellowship that we're – well, each meeting that we're a part of. So. Um, this meeting that we're doing right now is a meeting that's linked to um, a mainstream meeting that most of us well, – not a mainstream meeting – our primary meeting. So our home group, like for myself, I speak for myself. Um, my home group is a meeting that's on Sundays at noon, and it's the Al-Anon Big Book meeting. Um, and that's a meeting that was where I first was able to work the 12 steps and came to a new solution, which I – desperately hoped was out there but didn't believe before <laughs> before I found it. So that is the, the meeting that I'm a part of. Um, so what we're going to be doing in this meeting is a step speaker meeting. So in this step speaker meeting, um, it's going to be broken up in chunks. So this is the first Wednesday, and then we'll keep going on, and the next couple Wednesdays I'll be talking about different steps. So if you're new to 12 steps in general, um, there are 12 steps. <laughs> Um, and we are following them out of the big book. The big book is written um, – it was written in the 1920s. So that was when it was it first came out, and that's the book that we're reading. So we're reading it – we're doing the 12 steps from this book because the four founders who wrote this book were able to get um, recovered, and that's what we're following from. So, um, yeah. So that's what we're going to do. So this this one is the first steps, one, two, and three. These steps are decision steps. So what that means is as Al-Anons, so we, it's been said that we think like the alcoholic drinks. So the alcoholic, the one that we're talking about, and specifically this book is written for, is a chronic alcoholic. Now that alcoholic is somebody, what that means is that person, when they take that first drink, it triggers an allergy. So they consume that first drink, and they want the second more than the first and the third more than the second, and they can't stop. You know, they, they have every intention to just have a couple drinks and, like, be done with it. But they have something in them physically that cannot stop drinking once they start. And we don't have that component as obsessive thinkers, so, like, we think like they drink. Um, what we have is a behavioral allergy, if you want to call it that. And when we take that first thought, we can't stop, <laughs> and we're going to go on to the bitter end just like the alcoholic does if they're chronic, and it gets worse. So that's the person that we're talking about when we talk about the chronic person. So the people who um, attend this meeting, who attend the meeting on Sundays, they identify as chronic al -Anons. and that's, that's that concept of obsessive thinking. You know, we think like the alcoholic drinks, um, and we'll talk more about that as we go forward. I am going to read out of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'll kind of be referencing pages, but I'll be reading it kind of quickly. So just stick with me as we go through. Um, we've got the title page, and when we get to the title page, it says Alcoholics Anonymous, the story of how thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism. That is who the audience is to. So when they first wrote this book, there would be a couple of people that were really struggling with the drinking, and they couldn't stop. Um, Later on, we'll find this doctor who kind of was observing these people, and he saw that there was a certain amount of people, like maybe 10% of the alcoholics he took care of and treated. And, you know, a lot of people, like, they drank, and they, they went, they did this program that this doctor had, and, you know, like, um, nowadays it would be called a recovery center, but back then, you know, it was kind of just forming. And 
they got better and they kind of just went on, right? Like they, they were fine. They, they took the doctor's opinion and then they went. And then there's this 10% of people that like just didn't get it. You know, like there was something that wasn't clicking. Um, and they had this inability to stop. And this is what this doctor had called them the chronic variety. So that's what the book is written to. But those people that kind of came about and that like they talked to this doctor, his name is Dr. Silkworth. We'll get to him too. Um, they were realizing that they had something going on. So this spiritual thing started to develop amongst these people. And when they worked together, they were able to tap into some type of like, I don't want to say formula, some type of like, format where if they followed it, they were able to get out of their obsessive drinking. Um, and that's what this book is talking about. It's the collective opinion of all of those people. So by the time this book came into publication, there was a hundred men and women. So those were the people that wrote this book. It's not just one person. It's a whole bunch of drunks, <laughs> the chronic drunks that could not stop drinking. Um, this Dr. Silkworth said, hey, like, I don't know how to help you. Like, you're doomed. Like, there, it's a seemingly hopeless condition. Like, I don't know how to help you. Like, human aid solutions won't help. Like, I, my medical experience, I, you're doomed, right? And these people came together, and, like, they were able to figure out something. And that's what they wrote down in this book. Um, Bill is the primary author of it, but he had to go through all of these people to actually write it down. And all these people had the same experience, strength, and hope. Um, and that's what they've recorded in this. This this is the 12 steps that they followed in order to stop drinking. Um, and if we apply these same steps like these people did, and we, you know, do the thinking rather than the drinking, and then we also can look at it too, because we're al you know, we can look at it from the sense of seeing that this person's sick. You know, usually the people that we're affiliated with, we love these alcoholics. We, we love to hate them. <laughs> And um, we can look at it from two different perspectives. So this book is really unique um, for us in that, that regard. Okay, so we've got the preface on XI. Because this book has become the basic text of our society and has helped such large numbers of alcoholic men and women to recovery, there exists strong sentiment against any radical changes being made in it. So the preference is talking about, like, the book hasn't changed. Um, you'll see there's different editions. Um, this is the fourth one. But the first... 165 pages, I believe, remain the same. And then they just kind of added, like, things in the front, <laughs> and they changed the stories in the back. But that basic text has always stayed the same. They wrote it in the 1920s, I think, 1920s, 1930s, and it has never changed since then um, because it works, right? Like, it's, it's kind of like it's been described as, as a recipe. These people have this pie, you know, and, and they're like, they're just living their lives. They have this pie now. And these are the chronic drunks that could never formulate anything when it came to drinking. Once they started drinking, they could not stop. But if they, they, they learned how to make this pie and they could function in life, you know, so they just go around and they have this beautiful pie and you'll say, hey, I want that pie. Like, how did you do that pie? And it's the same, you know, the, the, the flour is the same, the sugar is the same, the bake time is the same. The ingredients haven't changed. The 12 steps themselves have not changed. And if we do it the same way that they did it, we'll get that same pie that they got. You know, like, we don't have to be stuck in our obsessive thinking. Like, there's a, there's a solution, and it doesn't have to be our obsessive thinking. All right, so the foreword of the first edition on XIII, it talks about the alcoholics being more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. For them, we hope these pages will prove so convincing that no further office indication will be necessary. We think this account of our experiences will help everyone better understand the alcoholic. Many do not comprehend that the alcoholic is a very sick person. And besides, we are sure that our way of living has its advantages for all. And and that's it, right? Like, they've got this beautiful pie, and it's, like, it's amazing. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you're alcoholic or not. You know, like, you look at that, and you're like, man, that is something nice. <laughs> it is something beautiful, right? And these are the people that were, like, hopeless. They couldn't stop drinking once they started drinking. And now they have this beautiful thing, right? Um, and we'll learn where that comes from, right? Like, it's not them who makes that pie. They literally just follow, like, higher powers and instructions. Um, and we'll learn more about this spiritual stuff as it comes along. 
but it's not them that makes that pie. They just follow the instructions, um, and and we'll we'll learn more about that as we keep going. So step one in um, in the twelve steps, it's on page fifty nine. We admitted that we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. So for us, you know, we were powerless over the alcohol, you know, the alcoholic. We're powerless over how the alcohol has affected us in our lives. Um, I'm going to kind of tie in a little bit of personal experience too to to make it make it um, make it more real, um, and that's you know that's how we do it in this program too is we share our experience to be helpful, um, not to rag on anybody because you know we're all pretty good at that. If you've come to this program and you're a chronic Alanon, you probably are very good at that. Um, I know myself; I can speak for myself. But you know this concept of alcohol. It, it affected me in my home as a child. Not everybody has alcohol that's affected them as a child, but, you know, like the alcohol came in and it, it affected the whole family. You know, my dad most likely has that whole alcohol. You know, he's um, been affected by it in the sense that he's allergic to it. So he would probably identify as a chronic alcoholic. I can't qualify him. He would only, he would qualify himself, you know, and that's not something he works. So, that's his choice. So he is affected by alcohol in the sense that he's allergic to it. And alcohol is still in the home. And then my mom is most likely a chronic Al-Anon. And she's affected by alcohol in the sense that she can't stop focusing on the alcoholic. And she just needs it to be a certain way. If only he didn't drink, then I would be okay. And that's how alcoholism has affected her. Because even if he drinks alcohol, the reality is she's still okay. <laughs> but her mind is warped in the sense that she can't see it different. Um, and that's how it kind of plays out when you see alcohol in a, in a family household. Um, but we're both powerless over alcohol. It just looks a little different for both people. Um, okay, so we've got the doctor's opinion on XXVIII. We believe and so suggested a few years ago the action of alcohol means chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy but the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temper drinker. These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form. So for the alcoholic, they have this body component, and in their body component, they, um, they're unable to consume alcohol <laughs> without having that trigger of that allergy. For an Al-Anon, it's very similar to a gambler. You know, when we get to this... So, and I'll, I'll kind of come back to this. So steps one, two, and three, these are kind of those decision steps. By the time we get to this program, our lives have really become unmanageable. We really see this concept of being powerless over alcohol because we're like nuts, you know, like we're, we're most likely isolated, you know, whatever relationships we have are very superficial. Um, and if people are really involved in our lives, they're most likely sick too, because as we progress in this illness, we get worse, not better. You know, we, we, we try self-help books. We try, um, like, marriage counseling or relationship counseling. Um, we, we try yoga. We try all types of different things, trying to eat better, exercise. You know, you name it, we've tried it. But something still keeps coming. You know, we are that common denominator. And we start, we start to see that, you know, if, if, thank goodness, we get clarity in that regard. And we're really sick. You know, we're usually really angry. We're really, like, not taking care of ourselves because when you fixate on somebody else, you tend not to take care of yourself. Um, and we're, we're, like, angry. <laughs> we're never content. You know, there's there's something about us. You know, we have, like, this anxiety, and we're just kind of, like, always trying to thread this needle, right? Like, if only it goes this way, then I'll be okay. So steps one, two, and three, um, and I'll kind of read steps two and three just so we get, like, a clarity over what they all are. Um, these are action steps or decision steps when we first come into program. And we, we've just gotten so sick and so far into it that we can see there's something up. Um, and, and we can't live with the thinking or without it, you know. We really like to think. Um, it's been said before that, like, our brains are like solver machines, you know. And we love that. Like, if we could put thoughts in and just, like, chew on them all day, like, we would just be in heaven, right? Like, just being able to think all the time. You know, you could put me in a white padded room and I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I'm going to be thinking and I'll be, I'll be just fine because I like my thoughts. 
I like to play pretend. I like to play in reality. I like to do anything I can do with my thinking. But it, it destroys my life. You know, it's like the alcoholic. You know, they like that first drink. But then they drink the whole bottle, and they're like, oh, my gosh, I did it again. I said I wasn't going to do it. And that's how we are with our thinking. We're like, oh, that sounds nice. You know, and we start playing with that thought. And we're like, gosh, I, I spent hours thinking about this. I have so much other things I have to do. Um, here's Here's one of those examples. I remember thinking about somebody else's laundry, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I'm like, oh, if it's clean, I'm going to tell them how I need to put it away. You know, you can put it in these shelves. You can put it in these drawers. But if it's dirty, I'm going to tell them how he needs to wash it. And I sat there and I thought about this laundry for two hours, and I had so many things I needed to get done, and I couldn't pull myself away from it. I mean, like, that's the kind of insanity that this illness brings you, is that, like, if you can't stop a thought and you just keep going with it, where you keep pushing other people with your thinking and your controlling and your managing, like, that's really something. And the fact that, like, I don't want to think about it, but I still do. And once I start, I can't stop. You know, that that's what we can relate to as a chronic Al-Anon, is when we start that thinking, we can't stop once we start. And then when we stop, like, say I go to sleep, I'll wake up and I'll look at the same pile of laundry and I can't stop thinking about it then. So if something else stops me, say, just like I pass out, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to start thinking about it again because I can't stop once I start. Um so two, came to believe a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And then step three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand him. Um, I just kind of wanted to give a lump sum of, like, those things so we can get that understanding. You know, like, those are our decision steps. You know, we admitted that we were powerless over our thinking and that our lives had become unmanageable. Um, and then two is came to believe a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, right? I can't do this anymore. I need something else to come in. Um, we'll talk more about what that higher power looks like, especially when we first start program, and then made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. We have to be willing to turn this over to something else because the common denominator is us. The problem resides in between our ears. Um, we're what bring the problem. Like the problem is somewhere in here. So I have to use something else in order to get out of this. Because if I continue using my brain, I'm going to stay stuck. Um, okay, so I'm going to head back into the, the big book, and I'm going to talk more on step one. Um, these are the things that they mentioned for the alcoholics, and they're totally relevant for us as al um, because we have that same mind. We're just not allergic to the alcohol like them. So they say, men and women drink essentially because they like the effect that is produced by their alcohol. For us, our thinking, right? We like how we feel when we first take that first thought. It feels so good. But we can never stay with it. You know, it never sustains. We're always looking for the next thing. Um, just like the alcoholic, you know, that first drink, that first sip is where it's at, and they can't get it. They can't get back to what it first felt like, that thing that gave them ease and comfort. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot after a time differentiate the true from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They are restless, irritable, and discontent until they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks, drinks which they see others taking with impunity. After they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, the phenomenon of craving develops, and they pass through the well-known stages of spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over, and unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there's very little hope of his recovery. Um, so this is really where we get stuck, you know, like the alcoholic. They have this phenomenon of craving. So like I mentioned before, they take that first drink, it triggers the allergy, and then their body's on board with it. Um, for us, you know, if we take that first obsessive thought, you know, if we're feeling itchy, <laughs> restless, irritable discontent, I had no idea what that meant, like when people mentioned that at first. What that means is just that we don't feel right, right? There's something that feels off. So what we do as al is we find a solution. If I think about X, Y, and Z, and here's an example, um, victimization. If only they didn't drink, then I would be okay. What was me, <laughs> right? Or they need to stop drinking because if they don't stop drinking, I'm going to lose my mind, right? which none of that makes any sense, just like the alcoholic here, when it talks about, you know, um,
when it talks about this concept of they can't tell the truth from the false. So like in our, like we it's it's not true that we need an alcoholic to stop drinking, right? That's just not true. They can keep drinking and we can be fine. Um, but when it comes to us as as these things, like we can't tell the truth from the fall. So it seems real to us that they need to stop drinking. But that's our first thought. So when we take that first thought and we run with it, you know, then we start thinking, oh, what, what would happen if they didn't drink? If they didn't drink, maybe I would be financially secure. If they didn't drink, maybe they would hold a job. If they didn't drink, maybe I wouldn't have to work so much. If they didn't drink, you know, and then we would start thinking about all this stuff. And we could just sit there in this and think, 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 right? Make them this ideal person that we want them to be and, and shove them all here and there. And we don't even have to talk to them, right? We could just be thinking about this all by ourselves. But then we have that resentment and that comes. And so that's that restless irritable discontent. You know, whenever we're feeling, ugh, you know, um, it's kind of like this, this itching inside of our chest. You know, somebody mentioned before, it's like spinning a kid toy, you know, and it's like, you keep spinning it, spinning it, spinning it, and then it's going to go. You know, it, it can't it can't be spun anymore, and it's going to go, 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 go. And that's how we are when we're feeling restless, irritable, discontent, just like the alcoholic. You know, they their solution is drink. Our solution is think. I'm going to manage, control this person. I'm going to fix their life. And then if their life is fixed, then I'll be okay. But we're never, we never get to that point. You know, it's it's not like we get that. Um, and that's that elusive. You know, like it's it doesn't last <laughs> You know, we might feel better for a quick second, you know, making them be the bad guy, blaming them. And there's many different things that we do in our illness. So we all have different character defects. Um, you know, we can play, we can be the victim, we can be the perpetrator, we could be whatever it takes to get the job done, you know, as long as we get that thought and we start going into it. Um, that's where we can get to. So, it, and it talks about being repeated over and over again. So we are progressive. We will progress in our illness and we will get sicker and sicker as time goes on. Um, it's not going to be just, you know, like I could think about it on my own. You know, it's going to be like, now I'm going to push buttons and I'm going to make this person do X, Y, and Z, or I need to leave this relationship because it's not giving me what I need. And, you know, we, we just keep going with our thoughts. And it talks about needing a psychic change. So if the person doesn't have a psychic change, there's very little hope of their recovery. And that's that spiritual experience. Um, they're starting to kind of touch on it. Now, spiritual experience, this is not a religious program. Religion has no place here. Um, I, I can speak from personal experience. I had religion before I came to the program, and I still just couldn't reach a higher power. Um, my higher power is the same as it was before program, totally not relevant. Everybody has different things. But if I were to just force my religion on people, then people would be limited, and there would be no way that people could all have this program because this is something that happens to people on all sex, all denominations, all, you know, rich, poor, it doesn't matter. There's so many people who think obsessively that to limit it to just one person, one personal group would be to, to squelch the fellowship. You know, we need to bring this to other people everywhere because that's what we're called to do. And it's, and it's a spiritual experience. So that spiritual experience is this higher power idea. Um, I just want to touch on this real quick while I'm here. So there's words that are italicized in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And like I mentioned before, it's like in the 1920s, 1930s. So they didn't have much money back at them. So whenever they italicized words, it cost them more money, and they, like, didn't have more money. So obviously they really wanted to make sure that these things were very important. And the only two times that there's italics in the, in the 12 steps is on step three and on step 11. And um, it's that concept of um, as we understood him. And that's what the talibized. So that spiritual experience is individualized. You know, it's, it's a higher power as we understand them as a person, right? Like religion has no place here. And the higher power can develop over time. That's what higher power is capable of doing, right? Like it's, it's a higher power. Some person mentioned that, you know, a tree was all they needed. And that tree was their higher power. And it was bigger than them. And it, it produced shade. It could have wind. And that's what they took. And that's they said, you know what? This tree is bigger than me. This is going to be my higher power. And they turned it over, <laughs> right? They just turned it over to the tree. And it worked for them. Hey, who knew? So the fact is that this higher power 
just needs to be outside of ourselves because we're the common denominator. That thinking is stuck in our brains, and we need to get out of ourselves. We need to get it out because our problem is that. It's that restless, irritable discontent. It's that spiritual malady. We can't reach that higher power because we're incapable of turning it over. Um, the problem resides in us. Um, okay. So the psychic change is that spiritual experience that starts to happen as we work the 12 steps, which is kind of like the 12 instruction pieces of this pie that's just so beautiful. Um, we start to get this psychic change and the psychic change is that spiritual experience happening within us. Um, and that's, that's the gift that happens as that's the beautiful pie. You know, that's the 12 steps what it teaches us to make this beautiful pie. You know, we just follow higher powers instructions. And as we do that, the spiritual experience happens. And we have this glorious pie in front of us. So the very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems he despaired of ever solving them, suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire. I'm going to just change it here for thinking. The only effort necessary being that he's being required that he follow a few simple rules. So, like, how cool, right? Doomed. I mean, that's what we come to. That's steps one, two, and three. When we get here, we've already made those decision steps. We've we're doomed. There's nothing that has worked, you know, and we're we're just at our wit's end. I can't stop thinking, like, all the time. Like, I'm trying to control this person, and all I can do is shame them or whatever we're doing in our illness, right? And it's, it's, it's controlling our lives. And we're good. A lot of times we're good in other areas. But when it comes to that one thought, that one person, that one relationship, you know, we're just, like, in it and it's like so wrong and we know it is but we can't stop ourselves once we start um and that's that doomed piece you know that's that that's that desperation that doom and that's actually a gift because that brings us to be able to continue on and to bring in you know my nothing i do works right and whatever i do it comes back to this thinking um because that's our solution our problem really isn't the alcoholic <laughs> as as it might have been said in some programs before, I know when I first started in mainstream Al-Anon in meetings, you know, we all just complained about the alcoholic. And, like, that was my solution, right? Like, I loved complaining about the alcoholic. If I complained about that man, it made me feel so much better because <laughs> it was them. It wasn't me, you know? Like, they were the scum of the earth. If they're the scum of the earth, I can't be, which is great because I always feel like the scum of the earth. But if I blame them, I feel better. So that's my solution. So – this deep core, this restless, irritable discontent inside of me is really where I feel like crap. But I feel better when I blame them because if I blame them, then it's not me, it's them, right? And that's really where it, what it looks like um, specifically here. But there's, like I mentioned, there's other ways that people have this thought process. Um, okay. And then it talks about the only effort necessary. So we follow these rules, and the rules are the 12 steps. And we follow that with a sponsor, a sponsor who's gone through the 12 steps before. That's how the four founders did it. That's how my sponsor did it. That's how I do it when I do, when I work, when I'm working with my protégés. You know, we have to work the 12 steps. If we're not doing that, um, if we're not working with the sponsor, then we're using our old ways of thinking. Um, we're chronic as if we're in this program, this is what we're doing. So we progress, we get worse, not better. And what that looks like is that, you know, I got recovered about three years ago. I will go right back. I won't go back to where I was three years ago. I will get sicker. So if I stop using my sponsor and telling her, you know, all the times that I want to blame, you know, X, Y, and Z, <laughs> if I stop utilizing this program, if I don't work the recipe, if I start adding this and taking that out, I will go back to my ways of thinking before because I'm doomed. I'm chronic. I will go right back to it. And I will use that old solution. I will use all of those old things. So I have to do this program. If I don't, I will die. <laughs> I know that. And that's that desperation. So it talks about on page 23, these observations would be academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink, thereby setting the terrible cycle of motion. The main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than his body. So here we see, you know, the alcoholic has the body component. But by page 23, they're like, not even like, whatever, the body's there, but whatever, it's the mind. <laughs> and we can identify with that because we have that same brain. Um, when an alcoholic drinks, the alcohol leaves their system in three days. In healthcare, they stop paying attention to the alcoholic after three days because the alcohol's gone, the risk of them having body issues is gone. 
But day three, you know, if they go back to drinking, why did they go back to drinking? It's out of their system. They don't have it anymore because they have that mind. They have that mind that tells them it's okay to take that drink. Oh, I'm not really that bad. I can have a drink. You know, and we're the same way with our thinking. Oh, oh, I, I can, I can just kind of like tell them what to do here and there, or blame them here, or micromanage here, or gossip here. Ah, it won't hurt me none. I haven't done anything like that in a while. You know, why would it, why would it be okay, bad this time? Now, once we take that first thought, we're going to go all the way. We're going to follow it through, because that's what we do in our thinking. The fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower practically becomes non-existent. We're unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force and memory the suffering and humiliation of a week or a month ago. We're without defense against the first drink, right? We don't remember, and that's, we have this disease of perception. We don't remember what we did the last time we got in an argument, right? We're like, it's just gone. Like, we don't have that memory, Um and we'll go in it again and again and again. And we're like, why did I do this? I said I wasn't going to have this argument. And here I am in the thick of it, and I can't stop. Why did I do it? Like, I know I do this every time. And I said I wasn't going to do it again, but I hear it is, and I did it. That's how we have that mind just like them. Um, we have a disease of perception where we can't see reality for what it is. We can't see that we have this thinking component. Um, and that really is our problem. It's our thoughts. You know, it's that concept of, we feel restless, irritable, discontent. So we use these thoughts in order to not feel that way. Um, and that's, we don't, we don't realize it, just like the alcoholic. You know, they forget what happened the last time they drank. Um, give me one second. Okay. So when this sort of thinking is fully established in individual with alcoholic tendencies, he has probably placed himself beyond human aid. And unless locked up, may die or go permanently insane. These stark and ugly facts have been confirmed by legions of alcoholics throughout history. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, we'll, I, I remember somebody saying, it's, it's like, we won't die of liver cirrhosis. Like, you know, the, a lot of alcoholics, they die from the poison of alcohol, but we'll die alone and mad at the world and God <laughs> for being there, right? And how true, because we blame, blame, blame. Like, we don't take credit for anything. You know, we're the victim or, or we're angry at people, you know, or we're blaming them for whatever. And we're just always like, you know, blah, blah, you know, like just always got something to say. You know, we, if only we could get our thoughts across and they would understand us, then it would be okay. You know, we just have these ideas and we just go with them. And we'll go, we'll get locked up, right? Whether it's, you know, like just stuck in our own thinking around other people, you know, like we just, we're just as sick as they are. Um, and, and if not sicker, you know, but um, <laughs> even that might be my own thinking. Yeah. Okay. So we got came, step two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, right? We can't do it. Our brains are the things that keep thinking. We have the spiritual malady, so we need to come into this point, like, ah, it's me. <laughs> it has to be me because every relationship that I'm in, it's always bing, bang, boom. It's the same thing. This person's different, but I still have this issue. This person's different, but I'm still doing the same thing. You know, and that's where we really see that we're the common denominator. On page 25, if you were seriously as alcoholic as we are, we believe there's no middle of the road solution. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible. And if we had passed into the region from which there is no return to human aid, we have but two alternatives. One, go on the bitter end, blotting out our consciousness of our intolerable situation as best as we could. And the other was to accept spiritual help. So that's what we have here, right? We've got solution. Solution one, we can continue to think and go on to the bitter end. You know, and it's, it's nasty. We've seen it. We're already in it. We know what that looks like. Or we can choose spiritual help. And what that spiritual help looks like is working these 12 steps. But we have to die to all of those old thinking. We cannot continue the way that we were. We don't get to run the show anymore. We'll learn this as, as time continues. Now it's higher power show. And we just kind of follow along, which is great, too, because we'll learn how freeing that is. And that's really where we get that freedom. We don't have to find the solution. We just lean into higher power, and higher power does that for us. And we'll get there as we continue on. But as we come here now, we have the option. My solution, keep doing the same thing, bashing my head against the wall, or higher power solution, spiritual help. And we'll see what that spiritual help looks like. Once more, the alcoholic at certain times has no effective mental defense against the first drink, except in a few rare cases, neither he nor other human being can 
provide such a defense. His defense must come from a higher power. Once again, the same thing. You know, we, we can't stop ourselves. Um, our willpower is actually very strong, <laughs> and that's kind of probably why we're stuck in this, because we'll go on to the bitter end. We will take it. We will. We can grit and grunt and bear it. You know, we will do it. We fight for it, right? We fight for our rightness, and it always destroys us. And that's really why, you know, we are this sick. <laughs> we we fight for that spiritual malady, right? And that's why we need to lean into a power that's greater than ourselves. Lack of power, that was a dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves, obviously. But where and how would we define this power? Well, that's exactly what this book is about. The main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. So we don't have to look anywhere else, right? We look to this higher power, and we've got, you know, the recipe, the 12 steps, the tools, they're here. Um, and we get to use those in order to get to that higher power. But we need a recovered sponsor because, once again, we have that thinker. Our brain is there, um, and we have to turn it to somebody else if they can see when we're in it, you know, because we can't see that, especially when we're first starting. We get a little bit more clarity. We can see when we're feeling uncomfortable, um, but we need somebody else in that process. And then we need to go help people, but we'll learn more about that. We need to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe, or am I willing to see, that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity? Um, as soon as a man can say that he does believe or willing to believe, we empathetically assure him that he is on his way. It has been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. Higher power is where it's at, right? And just the f- being willing. You know, if we just crack open the window just a little teeny tiny bit and we're like, you know what? What I'm doing isn't working, and I'm willing that something else, whether it be a tree, whether it be a higher power, whatever, you know, if I just crack it open a little bit, higher power floods in. What a gift, right? Like, we don't have to do much. We just have to be willing to open up that window and say, my way isn't working, and I'm willing to turn this over. And then higher power does his spiel, which is amazing. Um, And it says in this big book, higher powers of love, tolerance, patience, and kindliness. I always wanted this thing, desperately, had no idea how to do that because I have a spiritual malady. Um, and, yeah, that's that's what higher power shows. So step three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to God as we understood him. And this talks about on page 60. They talk about the alcoholic, the chapter to we agnostics, and our personal adventures, the before and after. They make three pertinent ideas. So that we're alcoholic, we couldn't manage our own lives. That's our step one that probably no power could have relieved our alcoholism. Um, That's kind of in between. Um, And that God could and would if he were sought, right? That's what it takes. We seek higher power, and higher power comes in. And we ask higher power what to do. And it's in this 12 steps. And as we do this, we go help other people. We go help other people that are suffering in their obsessive thinking like us. And as we do that, our insanity is removed, you know, and we get clarity by helping other people. Like, what? what? (laughs) Right? But it's a certain way. We can't do it the way that we used to do it, right? Because we always used to help people to get something, you know, like, I'm going to help you because that will make me look good. Look at that, I helped you. (laughs) I look so good right now, you know, but it, it doesn't work like that. You know, we help other people because we know what it's like to drown ourselves in a kiddie pool of thinking, right? We think we're in this giant ocean, and here we're just in a shallow end, and we're just drowning ourselves in our self-pity, in our resentments, in our fears, in all of this mucky stuff. We're just there, like, drowning ourselves. And somebody comes along and says, hey, you know you're in a kiddie pool, and you're drowning yourself, and we're like, what? And just them saying that, right? Like, you're obsessed with thinking, and this makes no sense. You're not being rational. Um, somebody being truthful and, and revealing that, that's where we start to realize, like, hey, like, wow, maybe maybe there is a different way. Maybe I don't have to do this. Maybe there's another solution. And that's what we do is we pick up our feet and we walk out of that water of thinking and, and getting stuck and, and not being able to move and being paralyzed by obsessively thinking, you know, and we go help other people. And, like, we'll see lots of people, you know, lots of people in that shallow end of the pool drowning themselves, you know, and we're like, hey, I have – this thing and we just walk by and they're like what is that and that's higher power higher power walking us by because if we didn't have higher power we'd still be drowning ourselves in that shallow end of the water because we don't know how to function without our thinking our thinking is what makes us feel like we're alive just for a little bit you know and then it's 
it's like we're like, what was me and we're in this misery. Um, but, yeah, that's what higher power is able to do for us. Being convinced that we're at step three, which means that we decided to turn our will and our life over to God as we understood him. Just what do we do by that? And just what do we mean? So page 62, this is the how and the why of it. First, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Next, we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. He is the principal. We are the agents. He is the father. We are his children. Most good ideas are simple, but this concept is the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we pass to freedom. That's what this book gives us. <laughs> we have freedom, right? And it's like that that concept of drowning ourselves in our own thinking in this, like, shallow water, right? There's no freedom in that. But it's all we know. It's our only solution. We're so sick, and, and, and that's all we got, you know? We're like bottom feeders, and we feel so awful, and we just blame others, criticize, play these games, because we have nothing else. Our lives have become unmanageable. But there's freedom, and that's what the higher power shows us. You know, that's what these steps show us, that we don't have to live in that. There's a new way to live. Um, and thank God, you know, thank God we don't have to stay in that. Okay. So when we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer. Being all-powerful, he provided what we needed. If we kept close to him and we performed his work well, established on such footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans, our designs. More and more, we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. As we felt new power flow in, we enjoyed peace of mind. As we discovered we could face life successively, successfully, <laughs> successfully, we became conscious of his presence. We became... We began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, and the hereafter we were reborn. Oh, my goodness. What a promise, right? These are the third set promises on page 63 of the big book. And, like, what a gift. And, you know, like, fear defined us in our illness. I can speak for myself. You know, like, when I was in my illness, I was afraid of everything. You know, I remember going to work and I'd be like, oh, my gosh, what are people going to think of me? Uh, Am I going to perform well? You know, what if I don't? This, this, and that. Do I look okay? Did I pluck my, my, my unibrow? You know, like I would think about such weird stuff. And I would like not be able to stop thinking about it. You know, I go to the bathroom, I look in the mirror, I'm like, oh, everybody can see. Oh, I still got a hair there. You know, I was focused on just stuff. You know, I was afraid of everything. I was afraid of my own shadow. But I didn't want anybody to know that, right? Like I, I held my composure. But that, that concept, you know, afraid of today, tomorrow, And hereafter, but we don't have to be. There's a new solution. We don't have to insert our old ways of thinking. Um, And that peace of mind, you know, all of these things come as we start to pull ourselves out of that water, you know. And just the realization that we're in it is where we get to be. You know, we're so desperate. We're looking and we're seeing that we can't stop thinking and we're just stuck in obsessing about other people, right? The fact that we can get to that place of realizing and then to have a new solution. Like, what a gift. Okay. I'm going to check here on my script and see where we're at here. I'm trying to do math in my head and figure out. Yeah, I think I have a little bit of time to to share a little bit more. So, you know, we as Al-Anons, um, wherever you come about from working this program, you know, whether you had 12 step experience before or whether this is brand new to you, um, if you identify with anything here, and like I mentioned, everybody has different character defects. So one story might be different than another story. You might not even relate to anything I'm saying, um, except for the fact that once you start an obsessive thought, you cannot stop, and that your life has become unmanageable, right? Stick tuned. Listen to other people. You might identify with their stories more. That'd be great. But the fact that you have an obsessive mind, and when you start thinking, you cannot stop, and that you feel like less than and miserable a lot, (laughs) and your life really just feels unmanageable, especially when it comes to this thinking, right? And and in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it talks about the alcoholic, the chronic alcoholic. You know, we are chronic al so we can identify with their, their thinking. Um, and there's many other fellowships, too, um, that 
And so when we can relate to that, it's that concept that, like, we have this powerlessness over it all, you know, and it's like we just feel so itchy, <laughs> you know. We just can identify with that, and we have to do something, right, whether it be rage, whether it be victimization, whether it might be resentment, you know, whatever it is. The fact that we feel like we need to do something because we feel so restless, irritable, discontent, you know, we just feel so wrong in our own skin. That really is an illness, you know, the fact that you can't stop inserting thoughts because you feel like you need to. Like, if you don't do it, then you're not going to be okay. I mean, that's identical to the alcoholic, you know, with their drinking. They need to drink, and they can't stop, you know, and it's like that gives them their ease and comfort. The fact that thinking gives us ease and comfort, right, like, that's that's an issue, right? The fact that we can't function without obsessively thinking about other people, solving other people's lives. You know, even if the person isn't around us, we're still thinking about them. You know, that really shows the illness that we have. Okay. So we have this in a preamble. So I'm going to talk about sponsorship um, and kind of follow up to the end of the meeting. If there's a little bit of time left, I'll come back and mention some more stuff. Give me one second. All right. A sponsor is anyone who has had a psychic change as a result of working the steps and has a willingness to work with others. For those looking for a sponsor to guide them through the steps, please stay tuned and have your pens ready to record phone numbers immediately after the meeting. Each Al-Anon group ought to be a spiritual entity having but one primary purpose, that of carrying the message of Al-Anon to those who still suffer. This is our primary spiritual aim. Our job as a group is to provide people with a place to learn about and work the steps. It has been our experience that working the steps consistently provides us with a better, saner life. We consider all else to be an outside issue. This includes personal problems. The proper, proper venue of sharing such problems is with the sponsor. This is, after all, where real recovery takes place, in working the steps with the sponsor. We are just so glad that we are all here because we are all here because we are not all there. <laughs> There will be a period of fellowship after the meeting if you have questions. If you need a sponsor, if you need to check in or get current, or if you want to discuss other literature, please stick around for the fellowship. That would be a better time for these subjects. Okay. So I think I have a couple of minutes. I just wanted to mention this real quick. Um, so. This is a set speaker meeting, which is kind of like a certain kind of format. There, the, there's the 12 sets, which we just talked about now, but there's also like the 12 traditions. And so the steps are for the individual person. You know, the individual is following their sponsor's guidelines. Um, their sponsor's guidelines are the steps. And that's how their sponsor guides them through and provides them how to make that pie that we talked about, you know, that pie of recovery, um, how to get out of their obsessive thinking and go help somebody else. That's really what the 12 steps do, and that's to the individual working with that sponsor. Now, the traditions, the 12 traditions are to the group as the steps are to the individual. So those 12 traditions keep the fellowship going. So there's really two components when it comes to big book group meetings. Um, one is the 12 steps with the individual and the sponsor, and the other is the traditions. And that is how the group stays functioning and making sure that they're following the precise instructions laid out in the big book um, and how to keep a meeting running so that it's the most helpful for the newcomer because that's our main goal. We get out of our obsessive thinking and we go help other people who have obsessive thinking. That's the goal of the 12 steps because as we do that, we gain clarity over our own illness. And what a gift because our illness is so intense and it's it has made our lives manageable. <laughs> All right, so I'll get back to this closing here. Seventh tradition states that every group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contribution. This group does not have payment structure in place and currently requires no overhead expenses. If you would like to fill Tradition 7, please direct contributions directly to the al World Service Office by visiting al for questions about this meeting or if you are looking for a sponsor, please send emails to Alanon Big Book Recovery 
at gmail.com. Al-Anon Big Book Recovery at gmail.com. Recordings can be accessed on YouTube by searching at the at symbol Al-Anon Step Speaker in the YouTube search box. If you are interested in other Al-Anon meetings that follow the Big Book, please visit www.alanonbigbooksolutiongroup.org. www.alanonbigbooksolutiongroup.org. All right. So reading from the big book on page 164. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize that we only know a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But you obviously cannot transmit something that you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and for countless others. This is the great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Now let's go ahead and have a moment of silence for the Alan who still suffers, that person who is still drowning themselves in the shallow end of the water and doesn't know. Um, know that there's a new solution, followed by the Lord's Prayer, or a prayer of your own choosing set in silence. Hmm. Whose Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so I still have three minutes before closing. (laughs) And I, I feel like I could just use up the time. Um, so next week we will be talking about steps four through seven. Um, and if you are interested and you want to find the big book, there are plenty of places that you can get them. Um, if you visit our website, which I mentioned before, and I will mention again, you can get the big book on there. I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure we have it there. But basically there's free big book anywhere. So, um, you can find the 12 steps there on page 59. Uh, finding a sponsor is the best place to get your recovery because we're going to keep using our sick brain. If you're the chronic Alamon, that's what we do. So we're not going to be able to solve it with our own thinking. Um, we have to find a recovered sponsor. And what a recovered sponsor is, is just somebody who's worked the 12 steps that's laid out in the big book. There are many of them. Um, you can listen to recordings on that meeting um, that I mentioned before, the www. Sorry, my pages are front and back. So www.alanonbigbooksolutiongroup.org. So if you go there, you'll find a whole bunch of recovered sponsors. You can ask them questions. They love to answer them Um, as recovered sponsors. We get more help (laughs) from talking to newcomers and newcomers might get from us because what we're doing is we're gaining clarity of our illness. Um, And that's what people get to do. You know, as a recovered sponsor, you work the steps and you help other people. And through helping other people, it's like higher power gives you more clarity of your illness, and then you're able to let go more of your ego and more of your selfishness and learn more about higher power because higher powers of love, tolerance, patience, and kindliness. And as we help other people in an authentic way and not the way that we used to do it, um, we gain that from higher power through helping other people, and we gain that clarity, which is just super fantastic. <clears throat> so, yeah, next week will be four through seven. If you want to read the 12 steps, they're on page 59 in the big book, and uh, look forward to it. I am going to end one minute early. Oh, no, one time. So I'm going to push star one and end the recording.